Assalamu alaikum brothers, sisters and friends Welcome to this week's GDM show The Global Dawa Movement show We're back with brother Sabur Ahmed this week Assalamu alaikum brother Sabur Alaikum salam How are you? Feeling great Excellent, nice to see you're feeling great today mashallah So today we're going to be discussing evolution once again We've done a few shows on evolution in the past couple of weeks And you know we've touched on it quite extensively It's a part of the failed hypothesis workshop And by the way there's one coming next month I believe on the 16th of January in Manchester You can check that on our IRO website So just a quick plug there But that aside we've Nicely covered, done Yeah I know very quickly and swiftly as well My ad Anyway So we've got We've covered this topic quite well uh, We're still covering it We'll continue to cover it over the next couple of weeks inshallah And today in particular we're going to be discussing something very interesting Which is well, the way you phrase it is three interesting aspects of human evolution in particular, right? Yep. So take it away. What do you want to discuss? So firstly, as we do at the beginning of every show to do with evolution or anything to do with science, the first thing we need to understand about science is it's revisable. Its conclusions can change. They're not written in stone. Why is that? Mm. Because of the nature of the scientific method is based on induction and so on and so forth. It's just, it's revisable. That's the key thing we put out there. And I think it's one of the most important things because it sets the, it sets the pre premise for it, the discussion. It gives well. the framework yes. within which this show sits, right? So new data can come that can go against your previous conclusions. Yep. We've covered that plenty of times. So that's the first thing to keep in mind. The first aspect which I want to discuss of human evolution that they give us this picture. Imran, yeah. it's sorted, right? We came from Africa, this particular location, this period ago this is how we evolved this is the mechanism by which we evolved and this picture right here the lucy fossil this is your great 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 yeah. great great grandmother or, whatever. or as dawkins said your hundred and something millionth ancestor was a fish right one of his videos so, right they, he goes even further back yeah, but the point is they have it well mapped out it's all sorted it's a nice picture we got our we got our nice uh diagrams look at this look at according that. to common knowledge it's a done deal everything is in place everything makes sense it's good enough to stick into textbooks it's good enough to teach at school as fact yep it's good enough basically as for it's as good as science gets yep so what's the problem the first problem is to speak about any aspect of human evolution with certainty would be a misunderstanding of the scientific method because the scientific method and all of its conclusions are revisable okay so when you say human evolution we got it sorted out this is the picture it's never going to change this is the truth the gospel truth is no longer science because science has to be falsifiable and right. all of its conclusions are revisable so it doesn't make sense to speak about human evolution with certainty the way that it's projected. Now, what's really interesting is... But it is the best we have, right? As far as the, from a scientific perspective. Well, that, that's, that, that's the third aspect we're going to go into. Right, okay, so, the, the first aspect is to speak about anything to do with human evolution, evolution, the science of human evolution, with certainty would be a mistake okay. because all, of scientific, all the scientific conclusions of Darwinism and science and human evolution is revisable. So, so why do we have... Now we can call them popularizers, if you like, like Richard Dawkins, who openly, for example, over Twitter, say, well, evolution is a fact. If you deny it, you are a so-and-so. Okay, even though he, on a popular level, says this, in his own book, you know, A Devil's Chaplain, he admits, you know, Darwinism can, you know, get discarded as new information comes. So okay. even though he may have this popular rhetoric, and others do as well, they all understand fundamentally that it, it, it's not absolute fact. Okay, they, so they, they all know that. So sometimes you want to call an apple an apple, and sometimes you want to call it an orange. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine for academics to do that, I guess, isn't it? I mean, we're all we're all looking for certainty, and some people try and look for certainty, and you know, it's it, it's not the right thing to look for certainty in science because okay. science is always revisable. Okay. So the second aspect which I want to speak about is that the science of human evolution is based upon something known as methodological naturalism. Mm. Right now, all that basically says is anything that scientists study, whether it's human beings, you know, Imran Hussein, <laughs> water cycle, whatever, they're going to look for naturalistic causes, forces, and processes and mechanisms. Right? They're not going to say, you know, the question of human origins, the null hypothesis, H A, uh, sorry, H O, won't be. Um, 
you know, human beings appeared in the fossil record without a prior cause. You know, they're not linked to something else. You can never have that in science. Okay. There'll always be either human beings evolved from X or human beings came from X where X is a naturalistic cause. So what you saying? There has to be a naturalistic explanation for our origins. There's no, for, there's no, you can't have the, the, the null hypothesis in this case, which would be, we just appeared. We just appeared. You okay. just don't have that. Okay. It's, it's, it's impossible okay. to have that, Fair right? Enough. So this is quite interesting that, uh, Gareth Nelson, the curator at the American Museum of Natural History, this is what he says. We've got to have some ancestors. We'll pick those. Why? Because we know they have to be there. And these are the best candidates. That's by and large the way it has worked. I am not exaggerating. Wow. Now somebody may turn around and run and say, yeah, but you're just taking this one guy and his quote and his opinion and you're basically showing that that's what the science of human evolution is based upon. Let's try it. Let's test it. Mm. Take this particular quotation to any biology teacher who teaches human evolution. We've got to have some ancestors. Just that first statement. Meaning human beings have to have some sort of prior ancestors, yeah. right? Would he deny that as an assumption of science? He can't. That's methodological naturalism. We'll pick those. Why? Because they, are the, they have to be there and these are the best candidates. Mm. Again, that's the way it works. The... Uh, the um, uh, you're using, using in induction yeah. and inference, yeah. right? So even though somebody may claim, well, you've just taken one guy's quote and this is not the way science works, you're misrepresenting science, yeah. something we hear all the time. Yeah. Take this particular quotation, take it to any biology professor mm. and see if you agree with the first two statements. And it's methodological naturalism that's there. Yeah. And now but the biologist Francis Crick, he put it this way. Biologists must constantly keep in mind that what they see was not designed but rather evolved so you can't just have human beings appeared you know fully functioning fully designed there has to be a prior link to it okay. now this is what i find really really interesting is what the biologist richard lewinton says we are forced by our a priori adherence to material causes to create an apparatus of investigation and set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. Moreover, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. Sounds very oh preachy, yeah. Yeah. right? So you have this methodological naturalism because of that imagine if there even there was no fossil record mm. and there was no junk dna and there was no vestigial organs and all these other things which they say is proof of evolution right. even if these things weren't there purely from the spectacles of methodological naturalism we'd be linked to something even if i came up with a hypothesis so so what you're saying it's 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 a presuppositional position that they have to maintain before they even do the research before they even do the science it's 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 it's, it's an a, assumption of it's science. an assumption basically that we have to find a naturalistic explanation uh, it couldn't be the null uh, option in this case nope. therefore we have we have this limited scope to work with so let's work within that and find what we can basically exactly so but that doesn't necessarily mean that what they come up with or conclude is going to be true necessarily. Of course not, because it's based on an assumption which yeah. again is unfounded. It's yeah. based on materialism. Now, the theory of panspermia, which is uh, first proposed by Francis Crick, and even today people like Richard Dawkins believe in it, right. the first cell, which we now know, you know, many biologists are saying there was no first cell, there was a whole group of cells, but let's just assume that they were right. There was one cell and from that one cell all you know, life emerged. Um, where does the first cell come from? Yeah. Well, Francis Crick thinks that aliens would have, uh, you know, seeded that on Earth. They sent it down to Earth. Um, Richard Dawkins also believes in something similar. Now, that's allowed within the scientific discourse yeah. because it's naturalistic. Also, the aquatic ape theory put together by the biologist Alistair Hardy, which basically says, put up your hand like this, right? Yeah. You see slight webbing? Yes. Yeah. So, this light webbing, coupled with the fact that, you know, human beings are mostly hairless compared to other primates, right. and also that we We're have obviously not good examples of that. <laughs> <laughs> Carry on with your. With no, your well, language. speak for yourself, okay? Okay. So we have fat storage near yeah. the skin. We also have various other features, and because of that, Alistair Hardy, the biologist, and others, 
believe that we didn't just come down from the trees and into the savanna and became bipedial. They say no, we became bipedial in the uh, sea at the water side, mm. and we, you know, we were swimming around for millions of years, okay. and that's where we developed. And you know what's really interesting? Mm. Again, scientific data can support many different interpretations. And they say, look, you take a baby, right? You chuck him in water, yeah. and he'll naturally swim. Yeah. Chuck a bonobo or a chimp in, they'll just <laughs> sink to the bottom like a rock, right? right? So we certainly have some features which they say are best explained by um, uh, us being aquatic, evolving from aquatic apes. Now that goes against the standard picture that we see of evolution. Okay. And the third hypothesis, which is put together by the geneticist Eugene uh, McCarthy, um, he's a hybrid specialist uh, who's published within Oxford University. He's a well-known, respected academic. And what he basically says is this. A chimp mated with a pig, which created the human line, mm. right? And he uses various evidence, you know, the fact that our hearts are very similar to pigs and a whole bunch of other things. And, you know, he... He says, this is how I believe human beings evolved. Well, there was confusion over, I believe, the Nebraska man and the tooth that they found, which was a pig tooth, which they didn't... So, I'm, I'm, so, so you, you can... I you guess can see, why, why he... You can see I, there's, there's some logic behind his... Uh, well, strange logic. yeah, because there's supposed to be some sort of uh, similarity between human and pig teeth as well. Okay. So, he's basically got his own hypothesis. Now, look at these hypotheses. We have the standard view. We came down from the trees into the savannah, became bipedal and so forth, and evolved over millions of years. We have Pansamia... Uh, aquatic ape theory, pig chimp hypotheses, all of these are allowed. But what's not allowed is that we appeared without a prior yep. cause. Okay, now we're going to go into the third aspect of human evolution. But just to sum things up, what we're basically, yep. I guess, dealing with here, just to put things into perspective for the guys watching this, is you have a window, if you like, an of opportunity, which is methodological naturalism from the scientific perspective. And within this, you have dots that you're trying to connect, right? And this is why we have so many different theories of course. trying to explain different aspects of human beings and so on and so yeah, forth. Yeah, because remember, the vast majority of fossils don't, you know, uh, the vast majority of organisms that have ever lived, mm. they don't fossilize. It's okay. a very rare event, right? Right. So for us to make up interpretations, we have very little to go with. And this is what John Reader, research fellow at UCL says. Hominoid collection is so tantalizingly incomplete and specimens themselves often so fragmented and inconclusive that more can be said about what is missing than what is present. Hence the amazing quantity of literature on the subject. Very few fossils indeed afford just one interpretation of their evolutionary significance. Most are capable of supporting several interpretations. Different authorities are free to stress different features with equal validity. But ever since Darwin's work inspired the notions that fossils linking modern man and extinct ancestor would provide the most convincing proof of human evolution. Preconceptions have led evidence by the nose in the study of fossil man. Right. So you can see preconceived notions, hmm. they actually have a huge impact because we have such little data. Yeah. And what's interesting, you know, they try and show this story as if it's so complete, but when you go to a scientific journal, the biggest scientific journal, the most important scientific journal in the world, Nature, right? It's senior editor, um, Henry Gee, this is what he says about human evolution. Fossil evidence of human evolutionary history is fragmentary and open to various interpretations. Fossil evidence of chimpanzee evolution is absent altogether. Mm. So you can see, there's so much missing. And even if you go to a book, I mean, what you see on National Geographic, right? When you pick up a, a issue of National Geographic, it's got this ape-like thing uh, staring at you, and it says almost human, yeah. right? You think it's a done deal. But all you need to do is just pick up any book, right? Any serious academic book on human evolution, and you'll start to see a lot of this is very speculative. Now, Imran, if I went to university and they were speaking about human evolution and I said this is inconclusive and it's, this is speculative and you guys don't even have a consensus on this and you guys have a disagreement, what do you think they'll call me? They'll chuck you out most likely. Yeah, they'll say, you know, you're a religious nut, you don't know what you're doing, speculative, no, it's a fact. Now, what's interesting is these words that I just used, 
these are used in an Oxford University publication hmm. on human evolution. This is what the Advanced <coughs> Biology book by Michael Kent, again, uh, published by Oxford. This is what he actually says. The study of evolution of modern humans from hominoid ancestors is very speculative. Mm. Much of our present understanding is based on very little evidence. Only a few thousand hominoid fossils have been discovered and most of these are incomplete. Sometimes similar bones collected over a wide area are assumed to be from the same individual but may actually be from different individuals. Mm. The following account of hominoid evolution does not pretend to be complete or undisputed. It's merely an attempt to bring together some of the information on hominoids that has gained general acceptance. Now imagine if I said that in my own words without referencing this book at university level. By the way, we're going to reference all of these quotes in the, at least in the description box below. So you didn't say this, you're obviously reading off a screen and it's been quoted by, uh, the, you're quoting the individual, Michael Kent. Michael yeah. Kent. Uh, again, you will run into many problems. Yeah. You, you would, and what's really interesting is the terminologies that we're using, academics use. Hmm. So when people speak about human evolution as if it's an absolute fact, you can tell it's just a social thing. It, you know, we're just social beings. Oh, look at this chart, look at this picture, look at this skull, Ooh, it must be true. <laughs> Use your brain cells. I'm yeah. sure there must be three brain cells in your brain that you think, wait, hang on a second, this doesn't make sense, this doesn't make sense, this doesn't make sense, yeah. right? There's loads of issues here. And you keep hearing this thing about missing links, right? Now, Imran, if you take your phone and you take a picture of yourself every single day, click, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Do that over a 30 year period. You'll see a slow transition from a beautiful young man to that picture of the guy with the two sticks I showed you on my computer, right? Yeah. You're going to see a slow, gradual decrease in um, your, your uh, you know, f uh, facial features, your hair, everything, right? Now, those pictures that you take over 30 years, every single day, how many pictures is that? Thousands, if not hundreds of thousands yeah. of pictures. Yeah. So, you've got all these thousands of pictures. Now, if I take those pictures and I line them up beautifully, yeah. right, I can see a nice, gradual, Change. Of Change. Time. Now, when it comes to human evolution, and on National Geographic on Discovery, they show an ape-like thing. Within like two minutes, it turns into a human being, and that's like seven million years, yeah. right? You would think, wow, they must have those millions, or maybe tens of millions of those fossils to make that beautiful transition. Right. They actually don't. So this whole concept of missing links doesn't make any sense because over these millions of potential species and millions of potential uh, organisms that you have, they only have what? They have a few thousand. Wow. Sometimes it's a chimp, sometimes they miscategorize it. It's an orangutan jaw mixed with a human being. So it's very inconclusive. And this is what um, the uh, philosopher John Wilkins, again, another atheist, the philosopher of biology, this is what he says. You know, when the press talks about we found the missing link. Yeah. Again, the press are talking about the missing link. Let's get one thing clear. There is no missing link. Rather, there are an indefinite number of missing branches. Right? Now, when, if, I, if I say, you know, you have millions of, uh, you know, all these things missing, right? They can't say we have 1%, 2%, 3%, because for you to do a percentage, you have to know how much is there. But we have no idea how much is there. And uh, John Wilkins says, they may be, for all we know, millions of missing species. Mm. And one species might be an ancestor to another species, and we have no idea. Right. So we're basically making so this guesses. Po this popularis popularized idea of a missing link that we're trying to... So people are being directed in the wrong way. We're looking for something which... The, the, Main, record, the record's missing. Right, yeah. We have a few random snapshots. We're not even sure what they are. Yeah. They might be, for example, the Neanderthal man was supposed to be our direct ancestor, mm. right? And then afterwards, in 1997, after some uh, DNA testing, they were like, no, it's not. And then you, you see them taking these U-turns all the time. So if there's, for example, 50 open, empty boxes, right? Yeah. 49 were filled. Yeah. One was empty, you can say, okay, here's the missing link right, yeah. that we're looking for. But what you're saying is that out of the 50, I don't know, maybe 30 empty, maybe 35 empty, maybe 40 empty. So it's not a case of finding one missing link, it's a case of trying to fill an entire record. Right? Your example is good. Yeah. It'd be better if you say there's a m potentially 
a big. million boxes right. and we have like five, six thousand or something. Wow. Okay. Right? And it's it's very confusing. Every couple of years they keep, and, and I'm going to go over this, they make major revisions, right? Mm. Now, I just want to speak about this fossil called Ida. Do you remember this fossil called Ida? Yep. Right. What, what do you know, remember about it? It was a fossil bones found, uh, you know, it was apparently the missing link. It was apparently the, the missing link, right, in 2009. It was on the Google front page, they made a documentary yep. about it, a book about it. David Attenborough said, this is the missing link, this is a fact, yeah. it's not a matter of speculation. They said this was going to be taught in textbooks for like a hundred years. Amazing fossil find, right? Its documentary was translated in many different languages. Yep. Now, in, this was in 2009, and after a few months, in a study published in Nature, this is what the anthropologist Chris Kirk concluded. Many lines of evidence indicate that Darwinus, which was the formal name of Ida, has nothing to do with human evolution. It was just an ancient lemur. Wow. That's it. But you can see the millions of people who, who were exposed to this Ida fossil, they don't even know, after a few months of this whole oh uh, thing, uh, the whole press release and all that, that this has nothing to do with human evolution and millions of people are actually still in the dark about Ida. So we get all these very hyped up examples of, uh, you know, this is the missing link and we finally found it. And I just want to cover one last thing before the end of the show. We've heard so much about junk DNA. Yeah. Junk DNA was another proof that Darwinists were using for human evolution. 97% of our DNA seemed to be non-functional, wasn't mm -hmm. really doing anything. Yep. So for a very long time, Richard Dawkins, Jerry Coyne, other famous biologists were using this as evidence of human evolution. You know, 97% is junk because when we used to be, you know, we used to use those particular parts of the DNA and then over time they just got clogged up in our system. In Richard Dawkins' book, The Greatest Show on Earth, he uses it as proof. He even uses it to mock God. Jerry Coyne, again, uses it as proof of human evolution. Then, what's really interesting is, in 2012, yeah. the study by ENCODE, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, they basically said most of the DNA seems to be doing something. And after this, pub after this study was actually published, Richard Dawkins said, well, of course, you know, you wouldn't really have junk in your DNA because natural selection would get rid of it. Right. So you see, when we didn't know it was, it didn't seem, it didn't seem to be doing anything. We just said, okay, it must be junk DNA. Yep. Afterwards, we discovered actually it's doing something. Richard Dawkins said, oh, no, no, natural selection must have got rid of it. But this is just really childish, right? You can't make conclusions, certain conclusions, on an inductive method. And look how silly someone like the philosopher um, Philip Kitchen must feel right now. This is what he said about junk DNA. A lot of the DNA is in there is not needed. It's junk. If it's intelligently designed, then God needs to go back to school. Yeah. Now, what Philip Kitchen should have done is actually said, well, it doesn't seem to be doing anything. Maybe science will find it has a function. Yep. But the thing is, scientists sometimes, even very intelligent, credible scientists who've done fantastic work, they can sometimes make a very bad conclusion that all scientific things that they've discovered or they helped discover, you know, they're not going to change. Even someone like Francis Crick, you know, he won the Nobel Prize, you know, he discovered the structure of DNA. This is what he had to say about junk DNA. Much DNA in high, higher organisms is little better than junk. And it would be folly in such cases to hunt obsessively for its function. Hmm. So even he, back in his days, he was just like, you know, just forget about it. It's just junk. But we know it's not junk. And this actual conclusion held science back. Because now we know that it's functional and, you know, there's switches, we can actually help to diagnose diseases and, you know, we can discover new medicines. So it was this dogmatic, dogmatic sort of belief, no, it's not going to change, yep. which was anti-science. So when we say science is inductive, we're actually being pro-science, not anti-science. Now, one last thing I want to cover. There's this theory known as the multi-regional theory, which was very popular amongst uh, the scientific community. Now, what this theory basically said, me and you, you know, modern Asians, we evolved separately to uh, modern Europeans, and they evolved separately to modern Australians, and they evolved separately to uh, modern 
Africans. So you have these different races, you have these different evolutions of human beings. And in 1987, just, you know, two years, I think that's the year that you were born, right? Yeah, well, it's an irrelevant point. <laughs> okay. Carrying on. In that year, and that's quite recently, they actually sort of did a U-turn. They went, no, um, you know, this multi-regional hypothesis is not true. The multi-regional hypothesis was, you know, uh, two million years ago, Homo erectus went all over the world. Then it slowly evolved into these four things, which I just mentioned. Yeah. And then they went, actually, no, what happened is... Um, around, you know, 60,000 to 200,000 years ago in Africa, that's where the origin of modern human beings is from. And then they came out and they spread all over the world. Yeah. So that's a major shift, right? And that was only due to one experiment, which involved something like 150 people right. and something known as my mitochondrial DNA. So it just goes to show you that when they teach you this is fact and this is true and this is never going to change mm. you have to remember one small piece of data can create a massive paradigm shift within the scientific community yeah. uh, that's a lot of information to take in i mean i'm still thinking about some of the points you made and they're quite eye-opening actually because it just shows you again what you started with that science is revisable it's inductive in nature, it, there's room for improvements based on new evidence that you may get, your theories may change, your conclusions may change and that's the nature of science and this is why it's very important we point this out over and over again because once you understand this you can appreciate what's happening within science or within in particular the field of evolu evolutionary biology and things will carry on changing most likely, right? So I guess the take-home message is that appreciate science for what it is, appreciate the theory of Darwinian evolution for what it is, it's a working model, it's the best we have currently scientifically via the lens of a methodological naturalism if you like and that's what it is, I mean this is why we have to be nuanced as Muslims as well and not freak out when we hear about the theory of evolution as we see Muslims do sometimes but to understand the nature of science and the nature of this theory as with every other theory of science right and once you understand this, you can see what's going on. I mean, you guys can connect the dots yourself. So hopefully this has been beneficial, inshallah. Make sure to tune into next week's show. And until then, Salaam Alaikum from me. I'm sure anything else, last words you want to say? My last piece of advice yep. is just to summarize what exactly you just said. Science is revisable. We can accept it as a model. Just don't freak out. You yeah. know, if something in science, if there's a conclusion which seems to go against your belief system, just realize that it's an inductive endeavor, it's a social enterprise, and it's something which can change. Yeah, if anything, it's exciting. Yeah. It's really exciting. I mean, how boring would like, it be if what, scientific conclusions course, were just fixed? It's like one minute you're looking at the research, you see Nebraska man, oh my god, wow. And, and then you're like, it's him, a pig's tooth. Yeah, and a right. pig's tooth. And then the next minute you see pig, pig uh, you know, we come from pigs or that we've, we, we, we back, went back to the water and then we came out of the water. And then you see, it's very interesting stuff. I mean, it just shows you that there is disagreement amongst the experts and it's very interesting to study the subject, basically. Yeah. But in its con within context, within the framework of understanding the philosophy of science and the limitations of science. So hopefully this has been beneficial brothers and sisters once again assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh